this is our, our fourth and final, uh, truly, truly, out of John 6. We have studied them in John 1, John 3, John 5, John 6. In John 6, he recorded four of these um, truly, truly. You'll recall that in John 6, 26 and 27, he introduced the first one. And after he introduced the first truly, truly in verse 26 and 27, they asked him a question uh, or made a statement to him of the similarity between the feeding of the 5,000 and the manna from heaven. And as a result of that, he changed uh, apparently his format. And he went to the bread idea. And all four of the truly trulys give you a different view of what Christ is teaching about he is the bread of God. And it came off that statement they made about manna bread, and he incorporated it into his truly truly lesson, and it, it developed quite a deal. So in, in verse 26, 27, in the first one, he gave it truly, truly, and then they, add, they interject this uh, idea out of Exodus 16 of manna, and he takes off with that. So that when we get into verses like 32, when we get to the second truly, truly, in verse 32 and 33, then he is in, he is the bread uh, out of heaven in verse 32 and 33. Um, if you're looking down with me on that, he's the bread of God out of heaven in verse 33 that gives life to the world. Then he goes to the third one uh, in verse 47. The, the group has, they've transpired from, a, you recall, the group has gone from seeking him out of the feeding of 5,000 to wanting signs, uh, now they're grumbling. I call them the scoffers. Now in verse 47, he picks up a third one, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the bread of life. Uh, he who believes in me has eternal life. I'm the bread of life. And he carries that subject uh, down to where I'm picking up today. He goes from 47 uh, through this truly, truly stuff, uh, doctrine, uh, down into 51. It is in 51 at the end of the third truly, truly. Notice this in verse 51. I am the living bread. I am the living bread. I am the living bread which, came, which comes down out of heaven. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, that, that's volitional, that's third class. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. You know why? Because it's the bread of living. It's the living bread. If you even eat it, you will live forever. And who is the bread? Jesus Christ. He said, I am the bread. Okay, I am the bread in 48. He says, if anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. All right? He introduces that idea. Now he's going to take that idea and he's going to introduce an, another concept in verses 52 through 58. Notice in verse 39 and 59, pop down to 59 for just a moment. Notice where he's teaching this. All of this truly, truly... Uh, doctrines that he has taught has been taught in a Jewish, during a Jewish synagogue service in Capernaum. All right? Just give you background. Now here we are. The Jews therefore began to argue with one another. Began to argue. Um, and let me tell you the Greek word that's it's kind of an interesting word. It's makoo. And it's a word that they were arguing, and they were war arguing and close to blows. It means 
It means to argue. Well, I just told you what it means. Okay? You've, you've probably been that where or been around people that argued and it looked like they were going to come to blows over it. This is the argument. Therefore, the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? That's just... And so they were arguing among themselves, not with him. They were arguing among themselves when he introduced that idea at the end of the third, truly, truly. So now he gives the fourth and final of John 6, truly, truly, I say to you, unless... This is really interesting in the Greek language. Maybe your Bible says except or unless. It's, it's a third class condition with a negative may. It's E-A-N dash M-E. That's a third class negative. That's a, it, it's a way to introduce an absolute negative. An absolute negative. Unless, now watch what he says. Unless, that's volitional, because third class condition is volition. Because it's an E-A-N, we know that the verb is subjunctive. All right? So he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. He's talking about eternal life, no spiritual life. You have no life in yourself. Listen, he's talking about a life to those who are physically alive. He's talking about a, another life, right? He's talking about spiritual life to those who have physical life. And he says, you will never get that spiritual life in you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. All right? Now, if you've paid attention to his Bible class, the, he has taught four doctrinal principles at one Bible study. You do understand that. So, while it's taken me <laughs> four weeks to do this, he did it in one setting. So that I have to remind you that when he's talking about eating and drinking, they're synonymous with believing. He's already made that connection. And he's making that connection because of what their interest was. He went with it. And he's going to come back to that idea. Now, he did another thing that's interesting. When he comes to the fourth truly, truly, he changed the word for eat. Every, every eating prior to this has been E-S-T-H-I-O. Which, when you say, let's go eat, let's go, let's go grab a sandwich, let's go eat lunch together, that's the word. That's the word. That's the typical, normal eating word. He doesn't use that word here. He uses trogo, T-R-O-G-O. He uses trogo. Trogo... <laughs> I tell you, Trogo, when you was a kid, did your parents tell you that you should chew your food good? Well, if, if you, I don't know, a parent in the whole wide world doesn't say you got to chew, you, quit swallowing your food whole, you got to chew it. Well, the child then the parent tells you because he chews once or twice and then swallows it. The parent goes to another position and says you've got to chew it 20 times. Right? Did your parents tell you that? Well, you should have lived in my generation with my family. Chew it 20 times. Now, that does make sense for your digestive system, doesn't it? I don't know. As soon as I realized my parents weren't counting, <laughs> because when we first started, I would cheat on them, and they'd say, I want you to chew, and I'm going to count them. Well, after a while, I realized, 
by the time I'm 14. No, I was, at some other point I realized they're not really counting, so I would, that's the word chew. And th when you see it, except one time, so he said, and I'm going to show you, he's going to say it every time except one time. He's going to use trogo every time except for one time. Then in verse uh, 40, 54, he who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. That's Jewish age, that's Jewish age thinking. Who's he talking at? Who's he talking to? Jews. Where? Synagogue. Okay. For, and then he says in verse 55, for my flesh is true food, f food, to food. <laughs> true, I got two food. Uh, it's true food and my blood is pure is true and my my blood is true drink right so the emphasis is eating and drinking in verse 50 says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides he's giving you different these are points he just gave you a different point and that is abide what's the word abide he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in, look at, and I in him. Do you see that? There's two abidings at one time. When you eat and drink, you abide in Christ, and Christ abides in you, right? We're talking salvation here. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, See, it's a living father and a living son. So he who eats me also shall live the life of God, the life of Christ will be in him. Do you understand that? The life of the father is the life of the son that is the life, the same life that's in the one who believes in Christ. It is called eternal life because you live forever because that's who God is. That's his life. Verse, verse, um, verse 58, this bread, this bread which came down out of heaven, now watch, not as the fathers ate, E-S-T-H-I-O, and died, but he who eats, trogo, T-R-O-G-O. Trogo eats this bread, will live forever. See what he just did? Okay. Let me have a quick word of prayer. And I'm going to knock this thing out. Okay? All I did was read the verses. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way. They understand the principle of spirituality, but those who are visiting with me maybe have picked me up the second hour. Your sins have to be confessed because you have to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people to live spiritual lives. We pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would encourage them uh, as I tell them that they have to confess their sins according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we approach the study of the Word of God in the same way we approach the living out of that Word of God in our life under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me get into my study with you on uh, point number one. I want to recall, recall your mind to something that has happened in John 6 that's really important to us, that one of the six spiritual bread metaphors used by Jesus to describe is used to describe all of them, all the bread analogies, all the bread metaphor are used to teach us the sacrifice. When he talks about eat my flesh and drink my blood, Right? We're talking about the sacrificial death for the sins of the world. Right? It's got to be a perfect Lamb of God, both in the body and in the blood. 
And that's what he's talking about here. Remember that the bread metaphor comes from the sign crowds connecting the feeding of the 5,000 to the desert manna of Exodus 16. That concept that they grabbed came out of that first where they introduced that idea, then he took it and ran with it. Okay? Where they said, our fathers ate manna in the desert. We ate it on the mountain with you in the feeding of the 5,000. They made that connection. It was a good connection. They had a good spiritual connection there. Jesus took it and ran with it. Like we all do when somebody comes up with something, we take where they are and try to take them to Christ, right? We pick them up where they are, their spiritual interests, and take them to Christ. Take them to the gospel. I mean, that's our... So he uses, in this, in these, um, in this passage of John, in the four truly trulys, he tells us six things about this bread in the, in the metaphor. I am the true bread out of heaven, in verse 32. I am the bread of God, in 33. I am the bread of life, in 35 and 47. I am the bread that came down out of heaven... Verses 40, 41 and 58. I am the living bread in 51. I am the bread of flesh and blood in 53 through 58. Okay? And remember, he picked that up from their, from their questioning him. They made a connection. And he went, whoa, okay. And so, but this is what he, you can see what he's doing here. And the bread... Look, we understand what he means by the bread, don't we? We know he means his body. Look, we do this at the Eucharist, right? For the believer, he talks about the bread, which is his body, and the cup, which is his blood, right? He taught this very principle. That's the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, isn't it? Well, he taught this... Uh, in, in John, listen to me now, in John 14 through 17, he taught that in the upper room discourse. Listen to me now, this is important. Listen, he taught it later to his disciples in the upper room, right? He's not, this is not what he's talking about in this passage in John 6. He's in a synagogue talking to a group of people trying to get them to come to understand that he is the savior of the world. You understand that? These are unbelievers that he's talking to in the true sense of the word. So that's important that we make that distinction. Jesus, Jesus used this bread metaphor in the rest, in, in the second, third, and fourth, truly, truly, to teach messianic concepts of him being Christ the Savior of the world. Here's the second point. The fourth truly, truly, which we're looking at today, has been interpreted by some Christian theologians as literal. They take this as literal. They think you actually, that you, listen, nobody actually ate the body and drank the blood of Jesus. But he's talking about the crucifixion. I mean, Nobody took him off the cross and ate him and drank and did that stuff. This is, this is not literal. This is not literal. This is symbolic. This is figurative speaking, brought up by them, not brought up by him, right? They brought this up. And so he took, like we all do, he took common ground, spiritual common ground, to teach people uh, to take him to the cross. They, listen, but there are some that take this. this they, there are some that have developed a doctrine connected with the church Eucharist. And it has a title, transubstantiation. And what it, what it means, simply, that when you take communion, bread and cup, the contents of the bread and the cup becomes the literal flesh and blood of Christ in the believer. That is not what he's teaching here. That's a message he should have taught. If it was a message to be taught, it should have been taught at the Last Supper, where the Last Supper cup and blood is connected to the church Eucharist, right? 
Come on now. People take this and do improper teaching to it. Jesus is not talking about this in John 6. He is talking about it in the upper room discourse. But he, that's, that's in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. What he's trying to do here is to try to get people saved. Okay. In John 6, we are before the time of the Last Supper. It is directed to unbelievers who are in need of eternal life. Right? The whole point of all four of these... If there is a common theme in all four of these truly trulys teaching why Christ came into the world, it's eternal life. It's mentioned in all of them. The common theme of all of these is eternal life. The common theme to eternal life is you can only get it through the, a personal relationship of believing in Jesus Christ can't get it any other way. Unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood, which is his sacrificial death, you cannot have eternal life. If you do, you have eternal life. That's life forever. You, you don't get it in transfusions. You get it one time at the cross. You don't get another one every time you come and do the Eucharist. You don't get a transfusion. He's not going to die many deaths. He's going to die one for all time. The bread of God and the blood, the bread of God and the blood, the bread of Christ and the blood is a spiritual metaphor like the Lamb of God that's come into the world to take away the sin of the world, right? It's a metaphor. It's a figurative speech. It's a figurative speech. In 1 Peter 1.19, Peter talks about the precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless. He uses the word lamb. John 1.29, the lamb of God. It's a, it's a metaphor. It's a, a metaphor that goes all the way back to shadow Christology. It goes back to the Word of God. The guy just trying to clean up some stuff here. Three, listening to the, for me, when I listen to these religious Jews argue about, among themselves, about what Christ was teaching reminds me of the three systems that we talk about, the three systems of perception. Empiricism, rationalism, and faith. Anytime you talk to anybody, that's what you go through. Those are the three doors. What Jesus is dealing with in this synagogue lesson are people who are into rationalism. They are a class example of rationalism of the natural man, the unbeliever. We saw it in verse 28. We saw it in verses 30 and 31. We saw it in verse 34, 41, 42, and 52. Now, I don't know if you paid attention to all that. But this is a common deal with these guys. They were, when they talked about signs, that was empiricism. When they were trying to figure out what what meaning he was giving them, they were into rationalism. They were flopping back and forth between these. The one place they weren't going, and that's unfortunate, is faith. Jesus kept saying, you've got to believe this. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the truth of the Word of God. And after you hear it, you have to understand it and believe it for it to be cycled into your life as faith. They fall short from that every time. If they can't get a sign of empiricism, then they move, they move to, well, are you, do you understand anything he's saying? Not a word. 
So, when Paul ran into this, he wrote two chapters on it. He, he wrote this, he wrote two great chapters in the book of 1 Corinthians. He wrote chapter 1 and chapter 2. He covered this very thing of the three, three, the three systems of perception. And he nailed it. In, verse, in the first chapter, verse uh, 18, he says, the message of the cross, that's what Jesus was giving them, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's the unbeliever under Adamic sin. But to us, being saved, it is the power of God. That's Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation of what? To everyone who believes. Not everyone who hears. You're not saved because you hear the gospel. You're saved when you when you understand it and believe it. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life. If you believe it, you get saved. That's what he's telling them. That's eating. That's understanding that he, his body is the perfect sacrifice. He who knew no sin became so. He bore our sins on his body. 1 Peter 2, 24. He bore our sins on his body. That's the bread. He sacrificed his life for us. He gave up his life. He shed his blood on behalf of our sins, not his. That's the perfect Lamb of God. That's the impeccable man who hung on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. You're not going to get it any other way. You don't get this by joining a church. You don't get this by going to a synagogue and hearing a great teacher. You get it because you understand that Christ came into this world, died on a cross for your, in your place for your sin that will send you to hell because that's the end result of it. He was buried and raised on the third day to give eternal life. And when you believe that, you get saved. And if you don't believe that, you don't get saved. If you do believe it, you have eternal life. It's given to you right then and there. If you don't believe it, you'll never get it any other way than I just explained it. Unless a man eat the flesh and drink the blood, he will never have eternal life. What does eating the flesh and drinking the blood mean? It means believing in a sacrificial, atoning death that we'll never have to experience because he did it for us. But if you want some real good reading on that subject of perceptions, then you ought to read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 because it's dynamite. They did it earlier in verse 42 of John 6. They, they were troubled when he kept talking this way in, in 42. They were troubled. They said, look, is not this Joseph's son? I went to school with his brothers. I mean, I know him. I bought, listen, I, he, he did a table for me. I bought a chair from him. He repaired my back door. How can this be, this guy? That's rationalism. You sit there, well, how can this be, Ron? How can this be? How can this be? How can it be? Listen, it'll never be unless you accept it by faith. If the cross is foolishness, you've overthought it. Here's the bottom line. You're a sinner. You were born to sinner. Christ was born to Savior. When you meet this guy on those terms and believe that he can take away your sinner and give you the identity of a saint, you just got saved. You're not going to get saved in any other way. You can sit in a church till the cows come home, as we used to say. Make you nothing. Just make you a pew warmer. Make you nothing. Listen, you ought to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, and listen to what you say, yes, Ron, I've already done it. Well, then share it with somebody who hasn't already done it. You're an ambassador of Christ. 
Who have you talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ to? It's not that your life doesn't touch people who have a need for it. Ron, I could never do that. What are you talking about? You could never do that. You can Listen, if you can talk about anything in life that has more than one sentence, you can do this. You talk about a lot of things, very complex things. Things that I wouldn't understand, you understand. You can go to a third and fourth level of understanding of something. And you tell me that you can't tell somebody that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and if they'll believe it, they'll be saved. That's all I'm asking you to do. Ambassador of Christ. I mean, that's all he did. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 14, it says the natural man, that's the unbeliever. We're all natural men. You're either a natural man or a spiritual man. No in between. No in between. That's the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians. First three chapters, 1, 2, and 3. The natural man in, in 2. And third, the, the, the chapter 3, you're a spiritual man. You're a natural man. A natural man does not have the Holy Spirit of God because he doesn't believe in the gospel of Christ. The spiritual man is a person who believes in the Christ and gets the Holy Spirit in his life because he believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in his, in his body and his body becomes a temple of God, which is a mobile church. I mean, you're a... Listen, people, people would say to me, well, preacher, uh, I don't go to church. I said, well, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and buried and raised from the dead? Yes, sir. I said, listen, buddy, you are a church. Well, I don't go to church. How is that possible? You are the church. I climbed down the back of a tractor up on Pine Mountain talking to an old boy. And boy, did he, 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 he put so much dirt on me right down the back of that tractor. I mean, he gave me, I mean, you go, preacher boy, he said, you want to climb, you want to talk to me, you're going to have to climb up on the back of this tractor. I said, well, I'm going to talk to you. So I climbed up on the back of that tractor. He rode me around. I mean, he stirred up. Oh, I mean, I was, I was covered. And I guess he thought that I'd never been covered with the stuff like that before. Listen, I rode on back a tractor with a spreader of manure. You know where that goes? The first part of it goes on you, and the last part of it goes on the field. I didn't tell him that I was an old farm boy. But I tell you, he gave me the right of my life. I told him the same story. He said to me, well, uh, uh, he's, he's the guy who told me. <laughs> he got drowned and off. He said, well, I, I think we probably, probably, we, I think you probably rode long enough. With, what do you think, preacher? I was just, oh, man, I, I spit dirt out of my mouth. I said, why don't you shut the tractor off for just a moment? He said, what? I said, I, look, you gave me my ride. I asked for it. Now give me the courtesy and turn this off for just a minute. He went, okay. You know how a guy, you ever seen a smile on a guy who just got you? That was him. Uh, I bet his mind was thinking, that old boy will never ride, climb up, come up. With all the fancy clothes and everything, I just come from the hospital visitation. <laughs> I didn't do that because I was a preacher. I did it because I was born again and wanted him to be born again. He tells me we shut the tra tractor off. He tells me, "Well, I'm one of those guys, but I go to church." I said, "Well, I've got some good news and bad news. Which one you want first? 
The good news is you are the church. The bad news is if you don't come to church, you're going to get disciplined because you've been told. <laughs> Jeez. Eh, boy. The Jews began to argue, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, that's the natural man. The natural man, the gospel is foolishness to the natural man. The natural man, the gospel is foolish. You know what's troubling to my soul, though, is when you're talking to believers and the truth is troubling to their souls. It sounds foolish to them. That bothers the stew out of me. The crowd, listen to this, the crowd in verse 60, I didn't go that far with you, but the crowd in verse 60, you know, this crowd is going to leave him. He's going to lose, 666, all the disciples are going to leave him. The crowd, the crowd said, this is the natural mind. The crowd said, this is a difficult or a hard saying. Who can listen to it? You know what this word, this word difficult, you know why it was hard? Listen to me why it was hard or difficult. Because the natural man can't understand the things of God. They're foolishness to him. You've got to be born again to understand that this is a spiritual book for spiritual people for a spiritual life. Al hit it today. You know, you might have the spiritual book and you might have the spiritual life. How come it's not working for you? I mean, you're a spiritual person. How come you don't have a spiritual life? Why is it you don't have a spiritual life? This, this crowd says, this is a difficult statement. Scleros, it's a hard, difficult, you know why? Rationalism. With rationalism, this was foolishness. This is foolishness. In verse 61 through 64, I wrote this down because I'm not studying it, because this group left. I teach the people who stay. I can't teach the people who leave. <laughs> Does this cause you to stumble? Jesus said that to Peter in Matthew 16. You remember that? When he said, Peter, you've become a stumbling block to me. That's the word. That's the same word. How does, how does this cause you to stumble? This word in your Bible might say offense. How is it that I've offended you by telling you the truth? How is it that I've offended you? How is it that I, what I've told you... Listen, what do you think I mean? I'm speaking in... In metaphor terms, does this cause you to stumble? Does this, does this cause you to be offended? What then if, third class condition, that what if then you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Boy, if you think the cross is going to knock your world apart, if you think what I do on the cross is going to knock your world apart, wait till three days later and 40 days past that when I ascend back to the Father. I'll tell you what he said, though. See the word see? Mm. That don't mean what you think. This word in the Greek language is spelled T-H-E-O-R-E-O. -E -O. In the English, it's the word theory. It is a word of perception. It's a perception word. What then if you see? What if you see? That's an E-A-N, -E if, with a subjunctive. What then if you see? A perception. Listen, one day, if you'll stay with me, if you'll stay with me, I'll go to the cross. This is what he's saying. I will go to the cross. Three days later, I'll be raised from the dead. Forty days later, I will ascend back to heaven from where I came, and you'll actually see it. And when you see it, you'll finally get it. But if you don't go this way, you'll never get it that way. You've got to, you've got to understand the dynamics of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. 
to understand the dynamics of what the, how this is going to relate to your life. It's just an interesting word. What if then you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Listen, you ought to circle this, buddy. Listen to this. It is the Holy Spirit that gives you life. See, that's 663. It is the Holy Spirit that gives you life. Listen, you get life. If you're in Christ, you get life. But it is technically given to you by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's talking about, the natural man in 1 Corinthians 2 and the spiritual man in 1 Corinthians 3. The Holy Spirit is given to you because you have life, eternal life. The Holy Spirit is eternal life. And He's going to cause that eternal life to flow out of your belly like artesian well water. Right? Your life under the ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to be just a gigantic thing for your life. And not only for your life, but for the life of the world. I'm going to, I've come to, listen, you're missing this. I've come to give you life, and I've come to give that life to the world. The world, we are that messenger of that life to the world. We are ambassadors of it. I've ran out of time. Let's pray. I want to give you a moment. I want you to think about this. Jesus came to bring life to the world. That life comes individually. It doesn't come to the world collectively. It, it comes to the individuals of the world. We have that life. We're to go out with that life under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We are the light to the world. We're the artesian well in John 7. We're that artesian well of life. The woman at the well. Oh, I wish I had that life. He said, well, listen, you are going to have it. And you're going to be the well to the city. You're going to be the well to your work. You're going to be the well to your family. You're going to be the well to your community, state, nation, and the world. This, I'm putting the life that the world needs in you now. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful. I pray, Father, that somehow we would understand the significance of this the significance of it. This is the message for the world. Jesus is teaching it himself. It is the message. The world, they just, they struggle with it. I know I struggled with it. I struggled with the rationalism of the gospel. It did seem foolish to me. And it boiled down, will I believe it or not? It boiled down to that kind of a decision in my life, a choice. Will I believe it or will I not believe it? It is because we walk by faith and not by sight so that when I believed it, I then saw it and I went cha-ching. I then saw it after I believed it. And I learned the principle of faith. You believe it and then see it. I'm so thankful for that. Encourage our hearts, Father. There's a world perishing, and we have the life. It's perishing. It's, it's dying. It's, and we have the life forever to give it. Eternal life. The life of God forever. Encourage our hearts to do that this week. In Jesus' name, amen.